In today's video, we're going to discuss Psalm 9. The main point of this psalm is that God is the eternal, glorious, and gracious judge. Again, God is the eternal, glorious, and gracious judge. The psalm begins in verses 1 through 2 with David praising God. Notice that it's the subject is the singular, I, not we, but I, not they, but I. I, this is a very personal praise. David is saying, I will worship God. And notice how extensive this praise is. David says, I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Not just with his heart, or part of his heart, but with his whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Not some. It doesn't even say I will recount your wondrous deeds. It's very specific. All of your wonderful deeds. Deeds. And notice then uh, the verbs that he chooses, exalt, this idea of leaping for joy, singing praise. This psalm begins with worship that is extensive and personal. And then in verses 3 through 10, we see uh, the reasons why David is giving this extensive and personal praise. And in verses 3 through 10, we see many reasons given. Uh, and really, these verses could be divided up into smaller units, but I think all of them are kind of giving us the idea why is David praising. We see in verse 3 that David is praising because when David's enemies turn away, like they retreat, they run from David, they stumble and they they perish. And why do they perish? Because God is maintaining David's just cause. So da God is the protector of David. He is the one who protects David by being the eternal and glorious and gracious judge. So David is praising God with extensive praise that's personal because uh, God protects David from his enemies. God rebukes the nations he makes them perish. So again, similar ideas in verse five to verse three. The enemy comes. Uh, the enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Uh, their cities you rooted out. So again, this idea of them perishing. It's the image here is this idea of agriculture. God just uprooting them. They come to everlasting ruins. God is the just judge who judges David's enemies. Now notice the contrast in uh, verse 6 with verses uh, uh, 7 and 8. Notice that the enemy comes to an everlasting ruin and that their memory perishes. So here we have this idea that the enemies are, are limited, they're mortal. But notice what David does in verse 7. The Lord sits enthroned forever. He establishes his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the world with uprightness. Here we're seeing the mortality of David's enemies, but the eternality of God. We're seeing the wickedness of David's enemies, how they judge in wickedness, but how the Lord judges in righteousness. He judges with uprightness. So we're seeing that David gives this personal and extensive praise because God is his protector. God is the glorious eternal and gracious judge. We see that God's judgment means uh, condemnation for the wicked. They, the wicked perish and they come to an everlasting ruin. Uh, but for those who trust, notice what it says, it's not those who are perfect. It's those who trust in God's name. Those who put their trust in God's name, God, uh, God doesn't forsake. Those who trust and seek after God, God does not forsake. So God is a glorious, gracious, and eternal judge. And therefore, David is giving personal and extensive praise. Now notice verse 11. There is a slight switch here that we quite don't see in our English Bibles. It's, it moves from the singular to the plural. So here David is giving this extensive praise, but now he's teaching his children, because notice it's those who sit enthroned in Zion, sing praises to the Lord, the entire dynasty of David. David's instructing his children who will sit on the throne, sing praises to God. It is their job to praise God because he is the eternal, 
glorious and gracious judge. It is it is their job to evangelize uh, the peoples because God is the glorious, gracious, and eternal judge. So that's the first half of Psalm 9. The second uh, half of Psalm 9 uh, begins with David making a request, be gracious to me, my Lord, see my affliction, those who hate me, um, O oh, you who lift me up from the gates of death. So a again, a personal request now. So he moved from personal praise to personal request. And why? So that David might recount God's praises, that he might rejoice in God's salvation. So the idea here is God save me that I might spread your glory, that I might tell the nations about your salvation and that I might tell the nations about your praises. So the very personal request for God's glory. And then we see in verses 15 through 18, confidence. David says the nations have sunk. They are destroyed. This is a past tense reality. Their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. This is, this is, God, David is confident this has happened. Therefore, the wicked shall return to Sheol because God has judged the wicked. God will judge the wicked. And because God is gracious to the needy, God will be gracious to the needy. Therefore, David gives one final request. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. So in this part of the psalm, he gives the request, a personal request for grace that he might spread the glory of God. He gives confidence that God will do this. And he ends with the request, let everybody know that you are God and they are men. Let everybody know that you are the eternal glorious and gracious God. And how are they going to know? By God being gracious to David. When God is gracious to David, he recounts their praise and rejoices in his salvation. So Psalm 9, the main idea is that God is the eternal, glorious, and gracious judge. It's a psalm of personal and extensive praise. It's a personal request that God would be great, that judge, that God would judge the wicked and be gracious to him that his glory might spread. So here are a few discussion questions. First, God's grace motivates confident praise and confident prayer in Psalm 9. Why, why is this the case? And can we describe our prayers and our praises as confident? Next, what gives David confidence in Psalm chapter Nine. Let's try and be very, very specific. Third, why does confident praise lead to the spreading of God's glory? Why does David's confident praise and confident prayer lead to God being glorified? And finally, how does God's judgment demonstrate his glory and humanity's limitedness. I hope that you enjoyed discussing Psalm 9 together and that this psalm transforms us to pray with confidence and to praise with confidence.